So welcome back to the Secret Trend YouTube channel. Today is a slightly different video. We have heard you saying uh, in the comment section and in DMs and in emails that you're really enjoying the Hayden Wiseman series. And we actually have a series like that starting with a weightlifter very soon. So watch this space. Today's video is along the same lines, but it's more of a kind of discreet one. It's just going to be an athlete spotlight. You've obviously heard us talking about strength and conditioning for athletes or real athletes like field athletes or team sport athletes and today we're going to look at one of the most promising athletes we have on the books his name is griffin phillipson okay fitz why don't you tell us who is griffin um how long have you been working with him what did he come to you for what kind of coaching did he need and we'll go from there so Griffin is a 20-year-old rugby player. He's a rugby player who's looking to go professional or is at a level where he could play professional rugby. He's a very, very good athlete. Currently, he's playing for Loughborough, so a university in the UK from Northern Ireland. Obviously, at the moment, he's back in Northern Ireland due to COVID-19 and due to the fact there's no rugby happening. He started training with me in... The first week in November. So I think around the 2nd of November might be the first day of training we had. He's basically come to us for, at that time, in-season rugby coaching. So strength and conditioning work for the kind of in-season, except there was no games happening, obviously, because of COVID. So he came to me for strength and conditioning work. And what we're doing or what we're developing with, with Griffin and what we're working towards is him being a stronger, more powerful and a higher capacity athlete. So one of the key factors that governs a prop's effectiveness or a front row rugby player's effectiveness is their strength and power. So how hard he can hit in a scrum, how hard he can hit a ruck. But what often holds them back is their general work capacity. And there's other small things like niggly injuries can hold them back too. So from day one with Griffin, what we started doing is building general strength. So getting very, very good raw strength numbers we were just looking at the program and I think week one with us, uh, he did three sets of 10 and around 105 kilos in the back squat. Right now he's doing five sets of five, pause back squat at 170 kilos. And I would say within the next two or three months, he'll do somewhere north of 230 kilos for a single. So his strength numbers are going up very, very well. And that's in spite of some very kind of restrictive training environments. He only has 170 kilos worth of plates and a barbell at the moment. So once the gyms open up and stuff, we will be pushing the top end a small bit more. So when you got Griffin first, did you do any kind of needs analysis? or I, So we know we have like an onboarding call and stuff, but did you do any kind of actual testing with him? Or did you have enough information to make a good stab at what you needed to go for from there? We're fairly lucky with Griffin. You know, he's, he's in a very good setup in the UK, so... He knew a lot of his numbers and that can be quite challenging if someone isn't aware of their numbers. So Griffin was coming in with a, a fairly good bank of data behind him. The first two weeks though was still a needs analysis stage. So seeing how he moved, seeing how the numbers affected him, seeing his fatigue or decaying of fatigue over the course of a week. And then we kind of molded the program around that. Something we still work on on like a weekly basis is fatigue management. So at the moment, he does eight sessions a week for me, uh, as well as some other skills work. But the eight sessions are uh, five, five strength or power training sessions. And then he does three running sessions, which are at the moment, some sprint work and some capacity work. So for a lot of people watching this will be aware of rugby, but a lot of people probably won't be aware of the kind of sports system that's involved in rugby. So... Typically for most players around the ages of kind of 18 to like 22 or maybe 23 is kind of the window for when you'll start becoming a professional or and if you haven't made it by then you're probably not going to make it. So this year and last year in particular have kind of fucked things up for most people in terms of COVID obviously has, has really kind of bucked the trend. But for most times if you're if you haven't made pro by the age of kind of early 20s it's very unlikely you're going to make pro for a rugby so what a lot of times happens is in those late teens, early 20s, a lot of these players will be in a university that's kind of a, a breeding ground and they'll be in, they'll be involved or they'll know the right people who 
are in touch with the provincial teams and the provincial teams will be will be watching a lot of these university games especially in uh european teams in particular so in ireland uk france a lot of these teams will obviously for other players they'll take them they'll look at national teams and look at other provincial teams and they'll try you know france for example is a great example of a country who poaches a lot of good athletes but pays them an absolute fortune but in other countries before they've gotten pro they'll be kind of late teens early 20s they'll be looking at these players and I know you've been the people who are kind of the the right people to be asking about have been looking for some performance markers. Do you want to talk through some of what those were? And then we'll get into how you kind of how you kind of push those and look for progress in them. Yeah, so when teams are looking for an athlete to develop or looking for an athlete to bring on board, they obviously have kind of standardized tests. These tests will change from sport to sport or from organization to organization. In the case of a front row, like a prop who's coming in as a slightly younger player, so like an academy level player, they're going to look for things like max strength numbers. So it might be a three rep max on a back squat, it might be a one rep max on a back squat. They're also going to look for their capacity to play the game. So like uh, the skill of being a prop, the ability to scrummage, the ability to function in a line out. They're also going to look like for speed and power numbers. So that might be a 20 meter sprint. It might be a an Illinois T test for agility. They'll have a number of things like this that are testing their basic, their capacity to play the game of rugby. So when we look at Griffin and when we look at developing the things he needs to develop, a major factor for most props is their ability to maintain body weight so they can be powerful throughout the entire game. What we're working on together is get basically getting Griffin to being 120 kilos or between 120 and 122 kilos, being able to do all of his eight sessions a week with no drop off. So a lot of the time, if you're really forcing somebody to be a certain body size and you push their training hard, there's going to be a drop off. You know what? Most of us, if our training frequency increases or our training volume increases, we're going to have a decrease in body weight or decrease in ability to maintain body weight. So what we're doing with Griffin is where we've brought him up to 122 ki- or 120 kilos at the moment. His training volume has stayed the same and we're gradually bringing up the level of capacity. So he does anywhere from four 400 meter runs a week all the way through to I think around 15 400s a week on his higher capacity weeks. We'll show you some of the numbers now. So in the initial weeks when Griffin was doing 400s, I would obviously prescribe all the times. So when you look at the initial times he's doing for a 400 meter run, granted you have to understand this is somebody doing eight sessions a week and they're 120 odd kilos. The 400 meter times would be 217, 216, 212, 205, 215, 216. And this was more than likely prescribed as a 2 minute 15 uh, 400 meter run. So it's a pretty pretty good clip and you'll see this is just auxiliary running work that's going on afterwards. This is actually the week after. So the week after he did 217, 205, 207, 215, 203, 206. So already there's a noted drop off here and this will be because the prescribed running pace would have dropped. So we'll probably have gone from 215 for his 400s down to around 205 for his 400s. The other running that would happen during the week would be like 1k runs. Uh, He might even have a mile run that would be like slow and conversational pace. So it's just gradually building capacity without really dropping his ability to recover into the toilet. And then he has lots of really short, fast sprints, lots of uh, agility work like those Illinois T drills we spoke about earlier. What you'll start seeing now in his later 400, so these are from this month on the black screen, you see 400 meter repeats, 155, 150, 202, 202. So like much, much faster times than this is from last week. 150, 151, 146, 146. Before that, he did two that were even faster, 128 and 142. So you can see Griffin's capacity for running faster and doing more volume at that faster running pace is getting better. He's also getting much better at his, like, the 20-meter sprints, the Illinois T drills, the 90-second drills, 
all those really common testing parameters. And that's, Gurf, like that question you asked earlier when you were saying, what tests are they looking for or what are the professional teams looking for? If you can get somebody to be much, much better at the test, you're obviously developing them to be a better athlete, but it's also going to stand them much better when they go into a testing environment if they have done Illinois T drills every week or whatever the agility drill you think is going to be used. If we can make that as as central to his training as possible, obviously specificity would dictate he's going to be a better athlete at those. So that was your kind of aerobic training, which is obviously incredibly important for rugby, but we you know Griffin is a huge amount of strength training, so was there did the program look similar did you use key performance indicators like you did with the aerobic stuff like the t-test did you do stuff like was a back squat involved every week or did things change was there any exercises that remained fairly consistent for griffin to do yeah the back squat was fundamental to the as like one of the main bipedal large high load exercises as you might expect uh griffin's high bar back squat was quite strong so i think he'd hit in excess of 200 kilos previously when he came in and started training started november obviously it said we were doing like three sets of 10 at 105 kilos between now and then um so that's around four and a bit months ago uh yeah four and a half five months ago griffin has obviously progressed his squat usually but he hasn't progressed his squat by doing anything crazy like squatting every day Griffin squats most weeks once or twice a week. Some weeks he will have like front squats built into that. Um, front squats bring about a, a slightly different stimulus and it they aren't as, as central to his program at the moment due to like a couple of things. A bit of an achy wrist. He also needs to just get his one rat max higher in his back squat and the front squat isn't the way he's going to do that at the moment. So it's important to note that like his squat numbers have gone up a lot, right? He's gotten a lot stronger in his squat. He's gained a lot of capacity in his squat. As you'll see from the videos, and like Gurf, we talked about it earlier, his squat looks a hell of a lot better, but it's not through doing anything crazy. It's through squatting once or twice a week with an intensity level that's appropriate, and then all the other accessory work is just making him a lot stronger as well. Um, On the, the point of like, important numbers for for griffin when he goes back to be tested deadlift is going to be a big one like deadlift especially for the the pack like for a forward in rugby it's it's an important lift it's something they'll look at when they're doing a a test or even a needs analysis once somebody is on board and a lot of the time they're going to test using a hex bar deadlift so if griffin was tested right now with a hex bar deadlift i have absolutely no doubt it would be an advance of 250 or 260 kilos he doesn't have that much weight at home, so he only has 170 kilos worth of plates. He also doesn't have a hex bar at home. So there's a number of, of factors like that, and I'm sure if you're in this position and you know what you're going to be tested on, yet you don't have access to that equipment, you might be quite anxious about it. But if you think the hex bar deadlift as an example, like it's it's basically a squat where you need some amount of grip strength and your back might be taxed slightly more than a squat so the things griffin has in his programs are he has pause squats he has squat in the quarters he also has a huge amount of rdls he has rdls to a deficit and he has some snatch grip deadlift work so he's working on all the components that go into a a very very heavy hex bar deadlift with only 170 kilos worth of plates when you were you guys are choosing assistance work was there was there things that remain constant or did you just pick things as needed and did you address issues or was there kind of certain like secondary importance assistance work that you guys were doing? Like I said, it was a picture of like renegade man makers there. Were they frequent or did it just depend on what you wanted him to do and what he enjoyed doing and stuff like that? Yeah. So how we selected the accessory work, you start off with your general framework for what I would expect a rugby player to to do what I know a rugby player needs to be doing in the weight room, uh, in their running work, in their prehab work. Then you start looking at like their onboarding information. So the information we get from athletes when they're coming on board is it's fairly comprehensive. Like we ask people to like vomit onto the form. And so you start looking at previous injuries, any current niggles they have, any areas of weakness they might perceive in themselves. And it's basically just start breaking those things down. 
one thing when Garf mentioned those uh, renegade man maker rows, so it's like a single arm row in a push up position, single arm row in a push up position, do a push up and then do a like a devil press. Those are in there because Griffin was extremely restricted with the equipment he had. So before he had a bar and some plates, he just had two dumbbells, and the heaviest those dumbbells went was 17 and a half kilos each. So a lot of his work was focused around that. And as you might imagine, if you have a very, very strong athlete, you need to start taxing them in other ways, just instead of driving the weight up or driving the volume up. So a lot of the exercises will be done uh, under a certain tempo. So we would dictate the speed of descent. We dictate the speed of ascent. Uh, we do a lot of kind of stability work, anti-rotation work, rotation work with the, the trunk and the midline. And then we really started driving up the core work. So I think in terms of core strength, Hayden or Griffin would definitely rival most of the athletes we have in the book or most of the athletes we've come across. So he'd be doing a weighted side plank with 17 and a half kilos on his hip, holding it for in excess of 90 seconds. Uh, I challenge you to go and do that now and not start shaking. So there's another aspect of rugby, I suppose, that is a little bit different from other sports and Obviously, rugby players will be well aware of this, people involved in it, but other people like weightlifters will just think, you know, all weightlifters are essentially the same bar, super heavyweights, and everyone else kind of trains the same. But Griffin, the, there's basically three different kinds of athletes on the team, essentially, like a new ranging from like really small, fast to like pretty athletic and big. And then we've just the absolute behemoths, which would be what Griffin would be, you know. So was there much difference in terms of the training that would have been done if Griffin was uh, like um, a fly half, for example, would the training have been the same, but the load have been less? Or would it have been a totally different tactic on about this? To be honest, it would have been a complete difference. I, exercise selection might have looked quite similar, but in terms of loading patterns and, and how we'd look to bring about progression, it would have been very, very different. So we spoke about like the, the 120 kilo mark, you know, um, and I think... If I look at Griffin's like onboarding information, I think he might have been 116 or 117 kilos when he came in first, which was pretty normal for him to play a lot of rugby games at. And he had finished playing some rugby games, so he was around that weight. So Griffin went into... Once we realized the season was kind of over, Griffin went into a, a more specific weight gaining phase. And that was we pulled back the intensity of running work so the volume of running he still did was quite high because i didn't want that aerobic base to go away but we start looking at like caloric intake the amount of recovery he can have in between sessions hit the job he works at can be quite physical so like all of these things are adding in if we had a fly half who needs like speed numbers a lot of prehab work he needs to make sure his Physical fitness is at the point whereby he can constantly be cognitively aware of everything that's happening. Like there's a lot more going on there than just raw strength and power. Their program would look completely different. And at the moment, Griffin's on like 4,000 to 4,200 calories a day. We just check this every so often. So he'll just send screenshots from his MyFitnessPal. He's very, very, very diligent with this. And... If you look at the videos of Griffin, like Griffin is in great shape. If you consider what you would look like as 120 kilos, you're probably not going to look like this, you know. Um, most people in excess of 105 kilos won't look this like trim or athletic um, at that weight. So that is important to note that like the programs are completely different and he can't, especially in a case so specialized as this, like a cookie cutter thing doesn't, tend to work or won't work eight times out of ten so probably the last part then is for someone like griffin who is you know not to put it very heavy-handed but his future is kind of in the balance over the next few months if we're being realistic about things um so like a year-long off season if used well could be one of the best things ever and might never come up again for someone in his position so what is what's the plan going forward over the next probably another six months before he plays a match i suppose so that's kind of really what's the plan so what's next for griffin um very simply there's two things so the first thing is to get strength and power numbers that are representative of the kind of the level of talent he's at so i want basically him to be hitting one rep max numbers that he can refer back to at any point 
um, and the ones that will stand to him for the rest of his career, basically. In basic numeric terms, like 230, 240 in for a very, very high quality back squad is what I'm looking for. Uh, if we go to more of a, a quarter squad or to just above parallel squat, that will translate to probably 255 or 260. Um, and I think those numbers are very, very doable for September time. Then for the hex bar deadlift, it will be 300 kilos is, is kind of where I'm looking at the moment. And those will, will act as as strength benchmarks for him. Strength is, is one of those beautiful things that it will stay with you for a long, long time. Even when he goes back to playing rugby, he'll always have that kind of genetic adaptation that came about through the training. The second thing then is is slightly shorter term. So I want Griffin to be going back into in-season training or pre-season training at the body weight he's at now with a very, very high level of aerobic prowess. So he is doing a lot of aerobic capacity work at the moment. His speed is quite good. His agility is quite good. But I want basically for his aerobic system to be so well adapted to training that once he goes back into that six-week or eight-week pre-season cycle that he's not going to drop a lot of body weight or his body weight probably won't change at all. Ideally, we'll be at a level of training or an intensity level in training with our aerobic work that it will actually be a slight step down and he can taper into the season. Uh, That's the plan at the moment. Obviously, the last five months has seen a lot of changes we've had to change the plan two different occasions due to factors outside of our control so look if things change again we'll always pivot again and go from there but I think he's in a great position now and and he's definitely one to watch for the future